and welcome to all the men and women of the West. I'm Joe, here with me is my co-host Stan. Hello and greetings. And we are starting the first part, Silmarillion Podcast. This is going to be divided into multiple parts. The first part being the Ainu Lindale, wherein we're going to spend some time discussing the aforementioned story from the Silmarillion. This story is that of the creation of the world, created via the music of Eru, Iluvatar, and the Ainur, who would later become the Valar and the Maiar. The Ainur are initially created by Eru's thoughts, his ponderings across endless ages. He spent a great deal of time also with each of the Ainur, propounding to them each a different part of the music that they would later have to produce, their voices sounding like trumpets, some like probably pianos, some like violins, sounding like every instrument imaginable in human history before they at last created. And it's a very, very melodious, but also almost frightening story of creation. It is biblical in its proportions. Every character had a role in the music. What's fascinating is also that while he doesn't appear in the story, Ulorin, or Mithrandir, or as we know him, Gandalf, was here. Saruman was here. Sauron participated, as did Morgoth, or as we should know him in this story, Melkor, as well as Manwe. They all participated. Aule, Tolkas, Ulmo, my favorite, they all had their role to play in the music. What's interesting is also that the Flame Imperishable is mentioned as being with Eru, Iluvatar. The Flame Imperishable in Catholic belief is the literal spirit of creation, the fire that God creates with. In Catholic beliefs, or Catholic metaphysical beliefs, it is believed that the Flame Imperishable is also the Holy Spirit. And in a sense, it's God himself. And this is really interesting how the flame imperishable is brought up, the secret fire, as Gandalf calls it in The Lord of the Rings. This fire is pretty much life itself. And there's a reason why it's placed into the void at the end of the story, where from its place in the void comes Middle Earth, Arda. This is a very important part of the story, but I can't help but wonder Flame Imperishable is with him, or within him, possibly. When he casts the Flame Imperishable to the center of Arda, is he throwing himself to the center? Does that mean he is Arda, and Arda's kind of almost like an outer shell? Also worth discussing is the mention that for many ages, Melkor would go out into the void before creation took place. He would go out into the void in search of the Flame Imperishable. It does beg the question, how did Melkor discover the existence of the Flame Imperishable? Was he always aware? Did he listen in on the conversations between Iluvatar and the others? Did he swap secrets with Manwe, his brother? Because the two are essentially twins. But what's also interesting is he would go out there all alone. It's during his wanderings that he began to get corrupted. He began to become more narcissistic, thinking only of himself and his own glory. These two different major ideas are, I think, worth exploring. Now, in a previous video, I explored how the music of the Ainur, they do it in three waves. The first wave seems like a battle which Melkor wins. The second battle is very close, but Melkor wins by the skin of his teeth. The third victory goes to Manwe and Eru Iluvatar, which that's kind of what goes down at the end of the Third Age. If you want more detail, go check out the Mystery of the Ainur video. We go into detail on that. And what were your thoughts on what I proposed when Eru casts the flame? Is he casting himself into the center? Is that why he rarely ever interferes? Now, he does interfere in the Second Age to destroy Numenor. Maybe one reason why he doesn't interfere too much is that he kind of can't on some level. Part of him is still in the Timeless Halls, but maybe the larger part of himself is inside Arda. Now, I'm not saying that's a certain that's just a theory, an idea. It wouldn't be the first mythology where primordial deity split into multiple parts. Yeah. Some of them inaccessible to him, him or her, others that contain their power, other parts that become their own entities. Exactly. In this case, it's complicated. Eru, just to disprove my own possible crackpot theory, there is mention that Gandalf is a disciple of the Secret Fire, and that Eru Iluvatar, who exists outside of Arda, can still create. So there is that element. But we cannot deny that the power of creation lies at the center of Arda. And that it still has a connection to Eru. But that Eru Iluvatar might have contained the flame within himself. There's some sort of connection there. And it's a very complex 
idea, I think. If Tolkien was still alive or Christopher was still alive, it'd be interesting to get their insight on this discussion. Mm -hmm. As for Melkor, what do you think of him wandering into the void? What do you think of the imagery there? Him exploring, searching, ferreting for that secret fire so that he could create. I really enjoyed that because it helped with pushing for the narrative and the conflict to be. What I found interesting as well is that the ability to create, later we see this in Feanor with the Silmarils, the ability to create something corrupts these people or these characters. What's also interesting is that this pride of Melkor's, this desire to create things from himself, corrupts him. In some literature, the idea is that creation is a greater power than destruction. It's easy to break something, it's harder to fix it. I think Tolkien was ascribing to that idea. The trouble is Melkor cannot create only corrupt, as people love to point out online. Here, the idea that Melkor is wanting this great power of creation for himself, I can't help but wonder maybe what he would create would just be more monstrosities. I, I the would... trouble is he wants to create but not out of love, but out of pride. I can't help but think of fell alchemical experiments and homunculi from Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood. Exactly. It's like in Star Wars, some Sith try to create things, but it just perverts these creations entire being into something that it isn't. Well, that's kind of what Melkor ends up doing a lot of. He corrupts and destroys and denigrates these things he's trying to put together. And he just creates more evil. Ultimately, Melkor, it's out of pride and narcissism. It's all about the ego there. He wants to create to glorify himself. The difference is that Eru Iluvatar created because he was lonely and out of love for his children. He was lonely, so he created from his thoughts. Then he grew to love these different entities. Now, here's something interesting. No two Valar or Maiar ever resemble each other in any way as characters. Now, what's interesting about that is you can see similarities between them, but they're not exactly alike. Saruman and Sauron have a lot of similarities, but there are key differences. You have Aule and Melkor, who are both smiths. There are very many similarities between the two, but they are fundamentally different. What I'm thinking is maybe when Eru Iluvatar created, for example, Manway and Melkor. No, he took them both aside and propounded his ideas of their theme of the music. The thing is, Manway came created from his thoughts with a certain role placed upon him. But he could have just been an empty automaton to do whatever Iluvatar wanted. So when Iluvatar took them aside, he breathed not the breath of life into them as one might say with Egyptian mythology, as Amun-Re and Fafar are prone to doing in that mythology, but he breathed into them will, independence, and their own personalities, sort of. They could either be corrupted or they could end up purifying themselves as time went on into holier versions of themselves. The notion I've once heard is that once Iluvatar creates something, it's separate from him. He can't control it because this falls into the theme in the Aule and Yavanna story, which we'll get to later. But the overall idea is Iluvatar creates, and so the creature or thing or whatever becomes separate from him. It becomes capable of exerting its own will and sub-creation under him. Because that's what the Ainur are doing in this story. Sub-creation. They're doing their own creation alongside him that helps to shape Middle-earth. You look at the elves. They are created by Luvatar, thus they are capable of willpower, but they're lesser than the Ainur, but in some ways they are greater because they have a freedom of choice between good and evil that most Ainur never really decide to exert. Well, some of them do. They're either corrupted over to Melkor's side, they staunchly stay with Manway. They can exert their own will, but they are given certain roles and they never budge from it. The elves and humans and dwarves can shift between each role that they want to their heart's content. But what's also interesting here is you have, in this case, will would have been introduced before the discord of Melkor, which means individual will and desire predates Melkor's corruptive influence. So an aspect of that will to, to be Melkor's narcissism, pride, and there might have been a part of that that was always there. I'm going to argue with Melkor, no, he wasn't always supposed to be a narcissist. He became that way when he began to... My theory is, and the way I'm reading it, is they all had their own individuality, right? Yes. Like, they all had their own personality. What happens is that Manway, for example, decides he's going to stay close to Daddy. He's going to keep tugging on his sleeve. Mm -hmm. He's going to go, hey, Daddy, pay attention to me, and I'm going to be a good little boy. Which, I'm not trying to demean Manway. I really like Manway, by the way. 
But Melkor said, Nah, I'm gonna go get a bike. I'm I'm going cross-country biking. I'm gonna have fun here. He got on his motorcycle, like, I don't know, Masamune Date from Sengoku Basara. I think he's got a bike in there. No, no, his, his reins of his horse is more shaped like a motorcycle handlebars. Okay. The thing is, there's a theory that when Melkor went out to, into the void, something corrupted him there. Now, what I hate is some fans want to use this to go, Aha! Cthulhu's there! I'm serious. I hate Lovecraft's mm, horror. Cthulhu. Uh, yeah, I don't like cosmic horror either. I find it boring. Because it's always the be-all, end-all answer for everything. For me, though, I tend to think... Okay, I'm going to go back to the idea of Lord of the Rings here real quick. It's not the end so much as the journey. The journey is what changes the characters. It's not the last thing that happens that ultimately changes them completely. It does affect change. I mean, the sh scouring of the Shire cements a lot of the changes that the heroes, such as Pippin, Mary, Frodo, and Sam go through. Story is about the shattering of their image of the Shire in a way as a peaceful place to come back home to. After all the traumas of the war that they fought in has been cemented into their minds. With Melkor, it's the journey into the void that corrupted him. But then when he comes back, he makes the decisions that ultimately corrupt him further. That's concreticizing the changes that he's been kind of doing to himself when he went out into the void. When he went out to explore for the imperishable flame. Before he went out, he was curious about the imperishable fire. It's while he was journeying in the void that he became obsessed. That it went from a curiosity to an obsession. Then it went from a obsession within his own mind, once he came back to the timeless halls, into something that would push him to action. So you could separate into three. Desire, thought, action. For example, Frodo, who desires to venture from the Shire to do his duty, then he thinks about it, then he goes out and does it. Now, he does it very reluctantly by the end, but he still does it. You have Bilbo, desire, thought, action. Tolkien often works like this. Desire, thought, action. I'm just saying the desire to go out of curiosity, let's say, then you have the thought. It becomes very powerful within their own minds. Then we see them lurch into action. And that's what happens with Melkor here. He does not immediately say well i'm gonna i'm gonna be an evil guy no it's he's curious and he really wants to create these are good qualities and tolkien often shows corruption through good qualities rather than them just being evil for its own sake typically although there are a few characters like that but let's be honest you've got sauron he wanted to bring order and stability to the world but then that desire started to become an obsession within his thoughts and his mind so then he initiated into action you have if i was to draw from another medium or franchise anakin was driven to evil by love for padme yes he wanted to save his wife but he also wanted to make obi-wan proud these two desires intermingled and balvin took advantage of them then it began to become the driving force behind his every thought then he you know initiated it into action and i know that this seems very basic desire thought action this theme of also being corrupted by your positive desires such yeah. as love curiosity wanting to create and being driven to obsession through it and then into evil action is very fascinating it's like that desire becomes a delusion and they want that delusion to become reality yes but that reality is a twisted version of, of events that very few can confront what the true reality is and then they just start to distort everything around them to fit with their world but really what they're doing is destroying everything around them that's what you're saying mm -hmm. yeah you you worded it better than i did i really like that they want to create or mold the world around them to fit their desire but it becomes a delusion and then they just they try to force the delusion onto reality I guess you could say playing 4K chess against themselves. They destroy themselves in this hunger and obsession for this delusion. And they escape from what is true reality. They're in denial. Exactly. They're in denial of what reality truly is. The Silmarillion just has endless tragedies that take place. All to try and break this sense of, this delusion in a way of Morgoth. But he can't break out of it and he never does. And it's very fascinating that his path to evil 
guides him also to his destruction. Same with Sauron, same with Saruman. It just leads to their death, but not before they lay waste to everything around them. Specifically to things they actually profess to have loved. Sauron just brings nothing but chaos and destruction when he loves control and stability. Morgoth pledges that he loved creation, but he brought nothing but destruction upon it. Saruman claims to really love order, but he brought nothing but anarchy and chaos as well. He also doesn't want to be meaningless. He wants his name to ring through the centuries, but he ends up little more than, historically, in-universe, little more than a footnote in Sauron and in Aragorn's stories, and in Gandalf, whom he was very jealous of. They often destroy what they want the most. Another thing that the music of the Ainur is compared to in the text is to a storm. A storm in endless wrath, which, you know, it's, you get the image of a tempest of waters, tidal waves, typhoons, maybe even infernos raging across the hall as you have almost a battle between those who have been infected by the discord of Melkor and those who are resisting it. The idea of the discord causes initially those corrupted to falter and break, and then they start joining in the discord. Those who try to fight against it do falter themselves and hesitate and pause before they try to lend their assistance to resist it. It's just a fascinating image, almost a violent one. And, you, and I never actually thought of music as being a particularly violent thing. I know people might point to, for example, the Fifth Symphony or the, I think it's the Fourth Piano Concerto of Beethoven. They're very, very violent. The Fourth, I think, puts the pianist against the orchestra. But at the end, they all come together and join together. The Fifth Symphony is more of an imperial march almost. It's very purple in coloration, if you were to give it a color. And the idea in Beethoven's music is always not violence for its own sake, but it's passion, it's beauty, it's sorrow, it's kindness. It's all the human emotions coming together and ringing across the centuries. And through sound, when you look at Melkor here versus Manwe's forces, Manwe and Elmo's forces, I should say, it almost feels like a battlefield, you know, where they're drawing swords and they're swinging at each other. This is the first battle, in a way, or the first war between Melkor and Manwe in the Silmarillion. What do you think of that assessment? When it came to the music, I couldn't help but imagine, sure, they're singing, but they're singing of turning into a bit of a tapestry that that tells every Lugatar's version that he wants this song and then you have Melkor coming in and it causes a almost superimposed over then you have Eru tries to weave over Melkor then Melkor tries to superimpose his again and, and that kind of thing yes it becomes chaotic and messy you've got tempers flaring over it and Boy, do you everyone ever. wants to control what this tapestry looks like in and a way what's also interesting is when the first wave of music ends eru iluvatar lifts up his left hand in traditional medieval thought the left hand was the hand of the devil that's why if you were left-handed they believed you were more susceptible to the devil it's the evil hand i believe it was uh, my uh, catholic school teacher once said it might have been the hand that adam and eve used to grab the apple i never really understood why it had to be left as a kid but if you look at it here, in a way, he's using his left hand. Now, on the other hand, there's something that people over the centuries noted that there was a common belief if you were left-handed, you had an advantage as a swordsman because nobody would be able to see it coming because most people are right-handed. It's reversed here, which gives you a, an unpredictability. So at the end of this first theme, with Eru lifting his left hand, it's unpredictability in that sense. In terms of a military sense, this kind of swordsmanship sense, he's unpredictable. But you might also say it's almost a giving in to Melkor there if he's lifting up the left hand. Or at least that would be the traditional Catholic thought of the medieval age. You know, he's kind of lifting the devil's hand up. And I know a lot of people are going to say, don't read it that way. But Tolkien was aware of all these things. It would have affected his decision on which hand to raise first. So in a way, everyone was lifting a hand saying, yeah, I can do some wrong here. You know, like that might be what the subtext is. Or it's just he's lifting his left hand before. You know, he got to lift one hand or the other. You then have him at the end of the second wave of music, lifting his right hand, which is believed to be the hand of righteousness, the hand of God, or the majority. So he's lifting his right hand up, signaling stop. Once again, this is the right action. In Tolkien's own words, then Iluvatar arose and the Ainur perceived that he smiled. And he lifted up his left hand and a new theme began amid the storm. 
and that's the second theme. But then later he says, Then again, Ilubatar arose, and the Ainur perceived as countenance was stern, and he lifted up his right hand, and behold, a third theme grew amid the confusion. When he lifts his right hand, he starts the third theme, the third age, I might argue. So there's a thread of goodness that's stretched through that age, which it's also interesting to note it's around that time that the hobbits became very prominent. So I wonder if him raising the right hand was the birth of hobbits. <laughs> I know I'm, I'm really reaching there, but I love hobbits. I love them almost as much as Tolkien. Almost. I don't think anyone could love hobbits as much as J.R.R. Tolkien could. I don't think anyone loved his world quite like him and his family did. But anyways. And at the end of the third theme, he raises both hands, signaling to everyone, stop. Song's over. The dance, dance revolution battle is over. Now, he's conducting throughout all of this. So the music being stopped with left, then right, then both hands, there's a messaging there, I think, that Tolkien is doing. With both hands raised, it's... I might argue, I don't know, like maybe neutral, maybe it's equal parts good, bad, which is mankind's nature. We are capable of great good and bad, which Tolkien was very attached to reminding people we are capable of both. I can't help but think the way you described it of Taoist philosophy where symbol of the Tao, you have the dark part, which the chaos, the darkness of the left hand, and then raising the right hand, which would represent the, the white portion, as in good and order, and then raising both hands, you have both together, which... Yeah, I hadn't thought of it that way, but I guess so. It's kind of reversed later when you have Sauron who's trying to bring order. Order here is bad, but then you have too much chaos, and that's bad too. So you want just enough chaos and just enough order to strike the perfect balance. With the end of the music, though, Eru Iluvatar shows to all the Ainur the beauty of Arda, saying, Ea, lo, behold, your creation. And he shows them a vision of Arda, and all of them fall in love with it. All of them desire it. He shares with the Ainur the vision, and they fall in love, and they decide, we want that. But he does tell them, you know, taking away the vision, you're going to actually have to work for it, sons and daughters. And so they venture forth. With the fading of the vision, we have each of them thinking about how they can improve the lot in life of the children of Iluvatar, the firstborn and the Adain. The firstborn being elves, the secondborn being man. And we get Melkor lying to himself saying, well, I just want what's best for everyone. Deep down, I'm a good person. He's not. And I like the wording. He lies to himself, which shows that Tolkien was under no illusions about this villain. He's irredeemable. By this point, corruption has seeped its fangs into Melkor way too deeply. There is nothing left of what he once was. But the thing is, he hides this side of himself from those around him. Oftentimes, corruption and destruction starts with the person. Mm -hmm. It's like he wants to obsess about corrupting everything that the first one he corrupts is himself. I will argue, I don't think Iluvatar realized just how deep ran the corruption on some level. That's me wanting Eru Iluvatar to kind of be fallible. But on the other hand, it makes more sense that he does realize on some level how far Melkor has fallen. So I do like how some would read there that Iluvatar is all seeing in a way. It makes sense. But Iluvatar warns Melkor, whatever you have in you has to have come from me first. There's nothing you have done that isn't too far for me to have done. Now, a lot of people say that means everything is predetermined. I argue no, and I'd also argue that instead, Iluvatar is warning I could have ended up like that. Be careful, son. If you keep going any further, you're going to damage yourself further. That said, the other argument against predetermination is that's stated outright in the Akalabeth that Eru Iluvatar changed his plans, that the destruction of Numenor was never his intent, and that he had to reshape Middle-earth and rethink his vision of Middle-earth. So we do have an acknowledgement that not everything is decided ahead of time, that Eru has his hopes for how things will turn out. It's just that Melkor and Manway do have individual will, and things do blow up in your face when you have individual will. The other thing is, Iluvatar actively tries to make peace between Ulmo and Melkor. Now, Melkor had a lot of ice and fire in him, 
Eru tries to tell Ulmo, your realm, which is the seas, which has more of the music of the Ainur than any other part of the world, which that's linked to Tolkien's passion for the sea, and the stars are also a main passion of his, but we'll see that later. We have the sea, which is magical and beautiful and whatnot. Because of Melkor's corruptions, it freezes, or it becomes gaseous. This is Melkor's influence. And Iluvatar tries to tell his two kids, listen, Melkor is kind of helping you out here. He's made water more beautiful in a way. And Ulmo kind of goes, yeah, but I still don't like him. Ulmo and Manwe form an alliance against Melkor, which the trouble is by the time that this discussion, this father-son's discussion happens, Melkor's now decided in his mind, I'm going to enslave the children of Iluvatar, which that's a big leap from I'm going to create for them, but not really, to they're my slaves. Melkor has by now done a huge leap in thought. And it's not that far, but at the same time, I can't help but think there's time that's passed. And there's constant mentions to time passing. What's also interesting is that there's talk of the deeps of time being amongst the stars. And this means that Eru Iluvatar's throne and realm can be found in the stars, which is a beautiful, very traditional mythological sense of things. What's more is that we got some Ainur who descend into the world who call themselves the Valar, powers of the world. And while the Valar are astounded by the vision and feel a deep sense of loss at its disappearance, their chiefs seem to be Manwe, Ulmo, Ale. Melkor was supposed to be one of them, but he's interfering everywhere, as mentioned on page 8 of the hardcover edition I have. We also get around that, well, on page 9, the mention that Manwe and Melkor are brothers. We also hear at this point of Manwe calling to himself many a spirits from the halls of Eru Iluvatar. Spirits that I think take on the shape of the Maiar. Other greater spirits become the other Valar. Aule and Ulmo have already heeded the call. There are a few Valar who come late, such as Tolkas, but for the most part, they answer the call. And the Valar finally take shape and hue. What's interesting is that it's mentioned that their physical shape that we might perceive is as raiment to the Valar. Raiment being an older term for clothing. And this literary decision is a very fascinating one where the idea is Eru Iluvatar is beyond our imagining, but so are the Valar. They are so unimaginably mighty in comparison to us mere mortals that taking shape itself is something they have to consciously do. They don't really have a shape. They wear it like raiment. From what we know from, thanks to Morgoth's ring and nature of Middle-earth, is that this raiment, this incarnation, is not something they do lightly. The Valar don't take shape for very long because it can be dangerous for them. If they incarnate for too long and then they start indulging in things like food or wine or women in the case of men and men in the case of women, of female ones, they become more and more imprisoned in the physical world and they lose themselves in it. This is kind of what happens to Melkor, Sauron, Saruman, and even Melian, who are all great, powerful spirits. But just as... You have Varda, for example, or Yavanna, who are very beautiful to behold, and Manwe, who's grand, and Ulmo, who's unimaginably majestic. Melkor takes a shape, and it's terrible. It is deformed by the envy and malice within his heart. The quote here says that, and he also took visible form, but because of his mood and the malice that burnt in him, that form was dark and terrible. And he descended upon Arda in power and majesty greater than any other of the Valar. As a mountain that wades in the sea and has its head above the clouds and is clad in ice and crowned with smoke and fire. And the light of the eyes of Melkor was like a flame that withers with heat and pierces with a deadly cold. Not exactly a pleasant image. What brings to mind for me here is Dante's Inferno in a way with Satan who... Waste, bottom down, Satan is imprisoned in cold, in ice. Here it says he wades, he's like a mountain that's, you know, wading through in the sea. That wording brings to mind the inferno with the devil and his three heads and upper body poke out of the ice. And he's currently trying to swallow and not doing a good job. Three great traitors in history. 
Brutus, Cassius, and Judas. Melkor takes on a shape here that he later comes to love a great deal. And this shape is not pretty to look at. It's deformed by his envy and malice. And once again, we have to bear in mind, in the Inferno, Satan is said to have once been beautiful, but he was deformed by his own evil, his own corruption. That's what happened here. And Tolkien is aware, he read the Dante's Inferno. He read Paradise Lost, the Divine Comedy. He read all those stories. He knew them. And I think he's too more Melkor in a way like that. But he does take Melkor in a different, very different direction. In terms of literature, it's a much more fascinating direction, I think. So that begs the question, what do you think here? of the end of this story it was very interesting and i felt like i was reading reading a mythological story straight out of mythology earlier you used the term biblical it felt like reading a book out of the bible yeah yeah it definitely feels on a biblical scale it's very majestic and in some ways catastrophic what happens here the act of creation does not seem to have been a clean or straightforward one that's very fascinating. There are birth pains for Arda here. But that about wraps up this video. How about we rate this story? Now we're going to be rating, reviewing and rating every individual Silmarillion story as they're really, in a way, different tales. The Ainul and Dali, I tend to view as part one to the Valaquenta stories, which involve just the creation of things. Up until the elves come in, I tend to view every story before that as part of one book almost within the Silmarillion. And then you got after that another good chunk of the story, which is another book and so on. I'm going to rate this a three and a half. I know it's going to get better. That's why I rate it three and a half. I love this creation story, though. I will say three. It is a good start to a much better story that is yet to come. Mm -hmm. And sometimes... I much prefer a lower rating beginning because I don't want later on the story to become terrible. Because it's, it's this story doesn't become terrible; it only gets better. But exactly. that said, because this is your first time reading it. Yes, it is the first time I read it. The lover of mythology within me is enjoying this, and I can't wait to see more. That's Tolkien's greatest gift: is being able to constantly get you to go. I want to see more and putting the carrot in front of you, and you just keep trying to grab at it. But that's all we've got for now. Next time, we're going to be discussing the Vala Quinta. And don't forget to like the video if you enjoyed our discussion. Read along with us, because we want to take you on this journey through the Silmarillion. We love, or at least I love the Silmarillion. It's my favorite book. I want to take you on this adventure, folks. And if you're really really enjoy this video and truly look forward to continuing this journey don't forget to smash that subscribe button like your melkor smashing his way for the music of the other einor